North American Society for Oceanic History was created by maritime scholars who met in 1971 at the University of Maine. They recognized that in North America there was no forum for maritime history or a society devoted to the study and promotion of maritime history. The aim of the original group of organizers was to create a diverse organization based initially on Canadian and American membership, which would gain the interest of others. Now there are members worldwide. And it is this diversity of membership that continues to make NASO a truly unique organization. 2020 marked the first year in recent memory that NASO was unable to meet, and therefore we bring historians, archaeologists, and students who are scheduled to present. Welcome to the North American Society for Oceanic History video and podcast. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. The goal of the NASO podcast is to bring you some of the best historians, professionals, and comers, newcomers in the field of maritime history. Today, we're returning to the Commonwealth of Virginia and being joined by Dr. Ed Marolda. Ed is a longtime member of NASO. He's a past winner of the John Lyman Book Award. Uh, he started working for the U.S. Navy in December of 1971 and moved up to the position of Senior Historian of the Navy for the Navy's History and Heritage Command before leaving as the Acting Director for Naval History. Dr. Marolda will be discussing Admirals Under Fire, U.S. Naval Leaders, and the Vietnam War. Welcome, Ed, to the NASO podcast. Thank you, Sal. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you, Ed. I can't think of anyone who does who fits that bill of 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 historian and professional better than you. And and just a note to our viewers and our listeners, probably the the one historian I've known the longest in a professional way is you. Uh, back in the 1990s, being introduced by uh, my at the time uh, master's advisor uh, Mike Palmer. So uh, I appreciate Ed. Is he's always been a great role model for me, and more importantly, just a, a great colleague. And so I'm very happy to have you on the podcast with us. That's well, very kind of you to say it has been a great relationship. And uh, whatever I've done to help you along, I hope that uh, is to the good. Oh, it's, it's been fantastic. So I'm, I'm really happy to have you on, especially now to talk about a new project you're working on. You're, you're looking at five admirals in the 1960s, 70s time frame who had a, a just a, a, an amazing role in not just operations of the U.S. Navy, but in plans and, 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 and really in, in setting the trajectory for the Navy into the 21st century. So I was wondering if you could introduce your topic that you're working on. Well, as you mentioned, the title is Admirals Under Fire of the U.S. Navy and the Vietnam War. And my object in putting together this book, which is going to be a large tome, uh, some of the publishers uh, don't like large tomes, but uh, I wanted to get it all in. And it really represents my lifetime of work on the U.S. Navy in the Vietnam War. Uh, as you know, I've done several books. I've done various products with you relating to the Navy in Vietnam. And I wanted to tie it all together, this, uh, this last, no, maybe not my last, but uh, the culmination of my, my career with the topic. And um, we think, well, Vietnam is its old history, ancient history, 50 years ago and, and more. But I think it really, the Vietnam War is relevant to what we're experiencing right now in this country. Uh, some of the cultural problems we have date back from the Vietnam War. Uh, differences of opinion about foreign policy, race relations, gender relations. Um, the civil military relationship is definitely uh, in the news today as it was back in, in the 60s and uh, in the 70s. So what I wanted to do was to look at the entirety of the war through the eyes of these five naval officers. And they were not only naval officers, they were you know, in charge of the US Navy, the three of them were chiefs of naval operations, but uh, they all had joint responsibilities. Admiral Thomas Moore, as a matter of fact, was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the others served in various uh, capacities, not only over naval forces, but with regard to all the, the U.S. Armed Forces. So I looked at, um, I'm looking at leadership. As a matter of fact, that's my central focus here. Um, their exercise of leadership, and I contrast with what they were faced with, with what their predecessors were faced with in World War II. Uh, Chester Nimitz, uh, Bill Halsey, uh, Raymond Spruance, and the others, they had, I don't want to say blessed because wartime is not a blessed event, but they were, they definitely had the advantage of uh, adult leadership from their civilian superiors. They had the country behind the war effort. They had the resources the United States devoted to their, their activity. 
and their leadership. And also they had uh, well-trained and hard-fighting servicemen and women. Now contrast that with the situation in the Vietnam War era, where civilian leadership had many problems. Lyndon Johnson, even John Kennedy, and Richard Nixon um, were not the best war leaders in my, my view. And they also had a populace that increasingly was turning against the war. Uh, you had not all the resources of the United States devoted to this, this operation. So to be a good leader really was a challenge for uh, these five admirals in, uh, in the Vietnam period. And covering, and I'll name the five, uh, Don Felt. Don Felt was Commander in Chief Pacific, that is in charge of all the US forces in the Pacific Theater. Some 900,000 uh, men and women from all the services and also um, some 500 ships, 5,000 aircraft. So it was a huge responsibility. He also had a diplomatic uh, responsibility with all the nations in the Far East and with upholding our treaty, treaties of alliance with Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand. Big, big responsibility. Um, he came to it with a great background. He was an aviator and he served as the vice chief of naval operations, that is the second in command in the Navy under Arleigh Burke, legendary Arleigh Burke. And he was uh, before that Sixth Fleet commander. So he had a lot of experience. And uh, Burke says, you're my guy to go out in the Pacific, which kind of surprised Felt because he thought, well, I thought I was in for other, other jobs. But Burke said, no, after the passage in 1958, of the Defense Reorganization Act, it gave a lot more power and influence to Sink Pack, the Pacific commander. He said, I want you out there. This is our hot spot in this era. I want my man in, in the spot. So out felt went. He was uh, very gifted in his job. He was a, a detail man. In fact, some referred to him as a micromanager par excellence. Uh, not a nice guy, at least in terms of um, his personal relationship. He was a hard ass, and it was said that he would eat Admirals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, so, short guy, maybe he had a Napoleon complex, but uh, very capable. And he was the guy, when he took over in 1958 as Pack, uh, he had the support of obviously Arlie Burke, he had the support of President Eisenhower, and uh, he got a lot of respect from his superiors and was given a lot of latitude in how he took care of business in Southeast Asia. Laos was the big problem back then. Uh, South Vietnam was also percolating. So he uh, took that on, he was listened to in the early period, but his influence started to wane when he got to, when well, the Kennedy administration came in. And this is something that not only he, but his successors would have to deal with, and that is the lack of real respect from the Kennedy administration, in particular, uh, Secretary McNamara and his civilian subordinates. Um, all the other naval officers had to deal with that, uh, that military divide, if you will, civil military divide. So his influence started to wane uh, toward the end of his tour in 1964. And but his one great claim to fame was that he realized that in Southeast Asia, it was no place for American troops. He said, this is their fight, the Laotians, the Vietnamese, it has to be their fight. Uh, we do not want to come in and start taking over the job that had to be done. So he was fully on board with the Kennedy administration's uh, use of special operations forces, uh, Green Berets, John Wayne and company, uh, Navy SEALs came on board at this time. He was all in favor of that, winning the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people for their government. Um, so he's very much simpatico with the Kennedy administration's approach there. However, as things started to go south, the counterinsurgency campaign against Ho Chi Minh's uh, communists uh, was not going well. He had trouble really understanding that. He had trouble understanding uh, what was driving a lot of Vietnamese, not only communist ideology, but nationalism. And 
anti-foreignism. They were tired of the French, they became tired of the Americans. He really didn't understand that in his headquarters at Camp Smith in Hawaii, a little bit out of touch. Um, he didn't understand the press. When David Halberstam and company, Neil Shane and others started to report from the field that this is not, we're not winning here, he had trouble accepting that. And at one point told the press, get on board. He didn't understand, they were just reporting what they saw. So the, uh, tragically, by the end of his term in uh, the summer of 1964, his influence had really waned. The, Washington wasn't listening to him. Uh, the war was not going well. The press wasn't listening to him. So kind of sad, but my, uh, again, my, my point with him was he did try as long as he could to hold off the introduction of major US forces to the war. I remember reading a comment by uh, Admiral uh, Lawson Red Ramage about, about Felt and, and mm -hmm. <laughs> saying that he was one of the toughest men he'd ever met. And I think uh, that was very, very telling for me coming from Red Ramage that he would say that about Felt. <laughs> right. uh, I, I think you're con you had a great comment there. I think it's, it's true this period of time is, is these senior admirals who had fought largely within you know, this World War II generation, they had fought, come up through the ranks. And then the civilian leadership had served also in World War II, but in a much more junior role. And it seems like that, that seems to be a big schism between them. These junior officers now are in positions of power, Secretary of Defense, and, and even you can make an argument, Kennedy, junior officer, now all of a sudden commander in chief. And, and so there's always that kind of almost that divide between the younger officers knowing better than the older officers. And it, it does seem to manifest itself in a lot of the decision makings here. Felt was sink pack for uh, six years so he was there a long time as you said you know watching that build up and and moving it over and that takes us into our next uh, person uh, that you looked at which is my favorite admiral name of all time which is ulysses simpson grant sharp okay yes uh, admiral sharp better known as Oli sharp it was his nickname and uh, his let's see his grandmother's brother's husband was the 18th president of the united states ulysses s grant um, he liked, well, he didn't play that up, but everyone knew that. Um, and Ole Sharp, he had served under, under Felt when uh, Sharp was commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet. That's the naval component of Sink Pack. So he'd been out there in 1963 and saw a lot of what was happening. Uh, like Felt, he was uh, a World War II veteran. Both of them earned uh, combat decorations for bravery and skill in, in their profession. And, um, and Sharp came up the same route. He was, as I mentioned, Pacific Fleet Commander. He, before that, he had served in the Pentagon as head of plans, uh, another Sharp guy. So he was observing what was happening in uh, Southeast Asia. Now, at this point, when he came in in July of 1964 as Sink Pack, uh, the, the Johnson administration had gone to the next step this Felt, Felton Sharp and the others in the national security establishment were really into the theory of flexible response. That is, if you've got an adversary that's not attacking you with nuclear weapons, how are you going to respond to it? If you have an adversary sending guerrillas into a village, you're not going to nuke the village. So they said you have to resp respond proportionate to the threat. So how do you deal with guerrillas? Well, you develop counter guerrillas, green berets and such. So that was the thinking, that proportionate response. And um, the Johnson administration pushed that. And here's what really uh, struck me as I did my study. Later on, Sharp, Felt, and many other military officers tried to divorce themselves from this theory, and saying such things as, oh, we would have nuked North Vietnam into nothingness and ended the war right there. That is not what they were proposing. That is not the plans that they were developing for the administration. Those were very proportionate, you know, baby steps, if you will, add a little power. You, you know, ultimately, you go from fighting guerrillas in the village up to bombing North Vietnam, done in a very systematic, supposedly systematic way. A sharp bought into that, uh, you know, really uh, put together the plans that were then looked at in Washington and approved on. Uh, so did Admiral Moore. Now, Admiral Moore, I'm bringing him in a little early here, but at this point, he was a commander of the 7th Fleet, 
and then he fleeted up to commander of the Pacific Fleet when, when Sharp moved up himself. So they were there at the beginning. Uh, they were fully on board with regard to uh, the use of air power in later they call it in driblets, but uh, proportionate use of air power against North Vietnam. Now it wasn't Armageddon. They weren't calling for the destruction of Hanoi, the overthrow of the government. They were going along with the administration's approach, which was hit them with a little bit more. At some point, this, as Johnson would say, this third-rate pissant country, North Vietnam, will, will cry uncle. Well, as we well know, uh, the North Vietnamese never cried uncle, and the proportionate response was inadequate. So the uh, sharp was, as I said, developed the plan, and the ultimate uh, military operation was called Rolling Thunder, a bombing campaign that began in March of 1965 through um, November 1968. Now, here's this plan for a, a proportionate applying pressure to North Vietnam to mend its ways and stop supporting the insurgency in South Vietnam. But by April, this is like one month after the inauguration of Rolling Thunder. Secretary of Defense McNamara and, of course, Johnson had already much, pretty much given up on the bombing campaign. This was Sharp's baby. And he said, wait a minute, what's going on here? What they did was say, we don't think the bombing is going to work. Instead, we're going to deploy U.S. Army troops into South Vietnam and prevent the enemy from winning. Not to win the war, but to prevent the enemy from winning. Sharp really had a problem with that. And he, he just, uh, for the next couple of years, kept saying, no, no, we need to add more power, more power, more power. And um, he got nowhere, really. I mean, he'd get dribs and drabs approved in Washington. But he became very, he was persistent in his call for more uh, naval and air power. And he became really a pain in the neck to the administration. At one point, uh, Johnson, President Johnson, referred to him as that man up there. He did not take kindly to <clears throat> Sharp's uh, propositions. And so he was increasingly losing influence with Washington. Uh, but to his credit now, he was, um, he was very supportive and he actually did a good job as Commander-in-Chief Pacific in regard to his Pacific-wide responsibilities. We had, as I mentioned earlier, five alliances out there. He made sure that we were keeping an eye on the Soviet Union, uh, the People's Republic of China, North Korea. And uh, quite often when those fighting in South Vietnam wanted to bring resources from the Pacific into Vietnam, he would say, no, no, we can't do that. We've got, don't forget, we've got the Chinese and North Koreans to deal with. Uh, so he, he kept the, held the line there. In fact, he, he was in control of the bombing operation. Even though he was unhappy with it, he was in control of it. And he did not want to divert all of his resources to, to Vietnam. On the other hand, when General Westmoreland, commander of US Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, uh, would often come to him, he'd say, I need some aircraft carrier bombings. I need more Marines. I need one. He would uh, do what he could to support General Westmoreland. So he tried to play a fair game. Uh, he was not a partisan Navy guy, although many would argue that in the Air Force in, in particular. But uh, he tried to be a, a good joint commander. And I think in that regard, he was successful. I'm always amazed uh, uh, in reading Vietnam histories, the, the, the amount of histories that don't include his role or, you know, he, he seems to be left out at many times. And, uh, you know, the amount of times that you read and it's all, it's Westmoreland's war, it, it, it's the Army's war and everything. But, but Grant, like you said, uh, Grant Sharp seems to have a major role in, in coordinating that effort in, in the logistics element, in the bombing campaign. And, and like you said, in the overall direction of the war in many ways. And, and I think it's very interesting how, that shift does take place. I think you're talking about how Johnson does kind of try to shut Sharp out in some ways, and, and maybe because he was getting what he wanted more out of Westmoreland than he was out of Sharp, creating that kind of division out there in the Pacific. Because I, I, again, I, th I think, you know, our concept 
of how we fight today under Goldwater Nichols wasn't quite in effect at that time, but but Sharp is was the overall commander for the Pacific at that time. I was in, it, 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 does that sound right? Well, that that's absolutely on on track. It's a good point. As a matter of fact, uh, Admiral Felt, you know, you know, uh, my good friend John Prados did a book on the Unwinnable War, the Vietnam War, and I may be mistaken, but I think I. I track that he doesn't even identify Admiral Felt in the index. And that is a massive tome. Uh, the same with Sharp. I mean, a lot of the histories give short shrift to the military commanders, which uh, they might not have been definitely directing the strategies and the policies that came from Washington, but they were definitely part of it. They had a, they had a voice, they had a say in. But you're right, at, uh, by the end of his term, just like Felt, Washington was bypassing Sink Pack to go to Westmoreland. Uh, that caused some <clears throat> some difficulty with uh, all concern, but they uh, they were focused on the ground war in South Vietnam. The air war was yeah, it's going to happen, but they didn't. Johnson and McNamara didn't have much hope for that being a success. And it seems like Sharp, you know, being detached from it, probably had the best overview of everything, and you know, not being literally on the ground like Westmoreland was. As a commander, you know, you want your commanders to have that step back to be able to see the entire picture. And, you know, reading what Sharp put in his books and what he said afterwards, it does seem like he had a better view of what was going on in, in the large strategic and even the tactical picture in some cases than he did. Uh, the next admiral you had was Thomas Moore. And I, I did a little reading on each of the admirals before we did this and, and just amazed by the career of Thomas Moore. It, it, it's incredible. Both, the only, I think he's the only person who ever served as both commander of Atlantic Fleet and Pacific Fleet, just, you know, CNO, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Wow. I mean, what an amazing career for a single he, he individual. Was <laughs> it was amazing. Actually incredible. As his predecessors, he, um, well, not predecessors, but the admirals that I mentioned earlier, uh, he was a World War II veteran. He f flew a PBY patrol plane in the South Pacific right at the beginning of the war. The plane was shot down. Um, a ship came by, a friendly ship, picked them up. The ship was sunk. Uh, they got in the water. He got, I think one man died in that whole episode, but he finally got out of it. And uh, later he earned a distinguished flying cross. So highly decorated as were uh, the other two. And uh, as you mentioned, he went on to be commander of the 7th Fleet, went up to Pacific Fleet, then over to the Atlantic Fleet, then chief of naval operations, and finally chairman of the Joint Chiefs, basically spanning the war in various capacities and definitely in the catbird seat. He, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Tom Moore, Thomas Moore, uh, born in you know, Mount Willing, Alabama. He was definitely an Alabama boy. And um, <clears throat> once he left uh, the Vietnam theater in the spring of 1965, the war was just heating up. As a matter of fact, he, uh, in his farewell address to the troops, he said, well, I feel like I'm a fire chief who's hooked up, hooked up all the hoses and got the trucks ready to put out the fire and then off I go. He, he wanted to stay there. And before he left, he even offered up the, uh, the fleet he said to the administration, you know, you've got uh, sailors and, and Marines out here with ships and planes. We can definitely have an impact on the war. Now, as a true naval leader, he was thinking in naval terms. He was not initially in favor of deploying ground troops to Vietnam, not, nor was Sharp. Uh, but after a bit, they were persuaded or maybe the pressure was great from Washington to take that step. Johnson definitely wanted ground troops. Now, they, their first attempt was, they said, well, we need to have ground troops just around Da Nang, a major port in northern South Vietnam, and also the site of airfields, and we were doing a combat operation, bombing operations in Laos, and reconnaissance and the rest. So they wanted to protect Da Nang, which they thought was very vulnerable. They said, all right, well, let the 9th Marine Expeditionary Brigade come in and do that. But they didn't want to go beyond that. But we now call it mission creep, of course. And before you know it, we had 500,000 troops in Vietnam. And they, they went along with that. And they basically, he said before he left, let me, uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps have a lot to offer here to, to help out in the effort. So then he goes off and heads the, the Pacific, I mean, the Atlantic Fleet. And following that, in 1967, becomes the Chief of Naval Operations. Now you think, well, 
he had a great opportunity here to really uh, use his experience in Southeast Asia to help the war effort. He tried as a CNO, he was a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but he later said, and others have documented this, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were basically neutered at this point. McNamara and Johnson were running the war. Um, the Joint Chiefs often were not listened to. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Earl Wheeler, was only invited to the White House for the weekly Tuesday lunch bombing sessions where Johnson, McNamara, and most and all the civilians of you know, the Rusk, Secretary of State, and others, McGeorge Bundy, National Security Advisor, would gather and plan the week's bombing. Here, there was no military person there until, until 19, late 1967 when they brought Wheeler in. Wheeler was not a powerful figure. Uh, so Moore complained the Joint Chiefs really had no say, real say in the direction of the war. But he had other fish to fry. As head of the Navy at the time, he still had to worry about the Soviet naval threat. He dealt with international crises. Remember the seizure of the Liberty in 1967, USS Liberty, the Pueblo in 1968, the Six Day War. There was a lot on his plate that took his attention. Plus, dealing with the U.S. Navy and how it was responding to the war. And the Navy was being cut of resources, and new ships were not being built in the numbers that he wanted or thought needed. Uh, he had personnel problems that were starting to perkle up, race and gender, and uh, disciplinary actions, a lot of it resulting from the war. Uh, so he had a lot to do. Um, he really didn't uh, shine, I have to say that, when he was seen. I mean, he carried out his duties, but he didn't stand out as having made a real difference. Only when he became chairman of the Joint Chiefs in 1970, uh, then he became really important because um, as the chairman, he had direct access to, to the White House and to the, to the Secretary of Defense. And President Nixon really took to Thomas Moore. They, they thought alike in many ways. They were socially and politically conservative, um, hard-nosed, you know, strong actions were what they, they liked to do. So Nixon really came to rely on Thomas Moore for a lot. And Moore didn't pass along a lot of that responsibility to the other Joint Chiefs. Um, because not only did he disagree with some of them and their, their takes on various military issues, but President Nixon had issues with some of the other uh, Joint Chiefs. Elmo Zumo, whom we'll get to later, uh, Nixon did not like Elmo Zumo for his social policies. Um, you had General Westmoreland when he went to Washington, became chief of staff of the army. Uh, he had already presided over a, a losing effort, so Nixon didn't care for, for him. Um, and then in comes uh, Creighton Abrams later on as chief of staff of the army, again, in some disfavor with the White House because of, of the Vietnam operations. So Moore became became the uh, go-to guy. He also got along very well with Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger. Uh, it was, you call it a coterie, a White House coterie that pretty much ran the war at that point on. Um, beginning in 1970, Thomas Moore was involved in the secret bombing in Cambodia, uh, the, the incursion into Cambodia that followed that, uh, the invasion of, of Laos in 1971, Lamson 719, um, the Easter Offensive, the re U.S. response to the Easter Offensive in 72, North Vietnam attacked in a big way, the mining of Haiphong Harbor, and finally the linebackers campaign, linebacker campaigns. He was the guy who really executed the president's direction of those operations. Key figure, key figure. He definitely seems to be the, the, a pivotal one in, in the five you're looking at. A very interesting one. Definitely the one that excels up to the highest level across the board and has his fingers in the most elements right here. And, and like you said, what a pivotal time for him to be both CNO at the end of the 60s and then uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs into the 70s. Just absolutely just essential for uh, 
really uh, creating that 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 the modern Navy in many ways that we see in coming out of the Vietnam War and transitioning over there. He he definitely seems his legacy afterwards. Does does he write a book? Does he does he write down his uh, is there a history? No, he, he did didn't. He, he didn't write a book, which is unusual. But um, his oral history done with the Naval Institute, three volumes. Wow. Very candid. I mean, he, a little bit too candid. And you wonder, is he saying all this because he's advancing in age? But if you want to see the real skinny on Thomas Moore and his views about things, some of them raise your eyebrows. Um, but uh, that, that those three oral histories, I would recommend. It's good, good reading. And um, one of the things that I want to get through with, with him, by that time in the war, when he became chairman of the Joint Chiefs, it was clear we were not winning. In fact, uh, Nixon came in promising we're going to get out of the Vietnam War. We're going to start withdrawing troops. So here's a, a naval officer who had fought in World War II, was victorious in World War II, and he had to preside over the military withdrawal from Southeast Asia. Now, others would, sit, would throw up their hands and say, we can't do this. I think Admiral Sharp somewhat threw up his hands and said, I can't handle this, and I'm out. <clears throat> but uh, Moore stayed in there. He said, I'm going to serve the commander in chief. Here's what he wants to do. And I'm going to faithfully carry that out. He was very loyal. Um, another thing, the Nixon administration, Nixon and Kissinger, really wanted to impress on the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China that despite what was happening in Vietnam, the United States was still a power to be reckoned with. And a lot of the actions they took, the mining, the linebacker campaigns, were focused on Moscow and Beijing. Uh, and he realized that. And where, for instance, you had a contrast with General Abrams, who was in charge of the, the ground war in South Vietnam, wanting more resources, more B-52 bombers and other things to support his operations. Uh, Ken, uh, Nixon and Kissinger and Moore had to tell him, no, you can't have more bombers. We've got to hold back some to impress the Soviets, the Chinese, and we have other fish to fry. So he was uh, very, he was also, he realized we're not gonna win the war. What became a very important issue for him was getting the prisoners back, our POWs. I mean, it was right at the top of his list of things we had to do. If we couldn't be assured of getting our prisoners back, no agreement. But once we got him, or promised we would get him, he signed on with the, the final agreement, January of, 60, of 73. So a pivotal figure, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, conservative. Uh, we'll talk about him in regard to his successors as CNO, uh, Elmo Zumwalt and Jim Holloway, and uh, they're dealing with uh, some other issues. Okay, my, the, uh, Fourth of my uh, naval officers that I'm looking at, Elmo R. Zumwalt Jr. Uh, he was one of the probably the most uh, well known of all the Vietnam era naval leaders, certainly, and even uh, overall leaders. Uh, fascinating character. Uh, President William Clinton spoke at his uh, funeral at the Naval Academy when he died in 2000. Um, books have been written about him, he wrote his own books. Uh, on watch is probably the most well-known. Uh, also, my father, my son, about his son uh, Elmo's uh, tragic experience in Vietnam, ultimately dying from what they think was from Agent Orange exposure. Uh, Elmo, Elmo Zumwalt, uh, very engaging character. I met him several times, and he was very supportive of Vietnam War studies. He uh, he got a start in the in the Pentagon. He was an up-and-comer, and he uh, attached himself to uh, Paul Nitze, who was one of the great leaders of the Cold War uh, in the Cold War military history establishment. And um, Elmo Zumo and Nitze, because Nitze's focus was there, was on arms control in the early days, and he brought Zumo on to help him in that regard. Uh, later on, he brought Elmo Zumo uh, as his aide his special aide. So they got very close and uh, Nitsi had a strong influence out of over Elmo Zumwalt's uh, development. So those were his areas of interest. Uh, Vietnam was sort of a, a sidelight at that point. 
And uh, in fact, Mitzi had really started to turn against the war. Mitzi was also Secretary of the Navy at one point. And uh, Zumwalt took that on board as well. But in um, 1970, uh, there was need for the guy to be in charge of all naval forces in South Vietnam. It's called Commander Naval Forces Vietnam, Com Nav 4V. And Zumwalt's predecessor, Kenneth L. Veth, uh, had not impressed a lot of folks that he was helping the Navy do its part in the Vietnam War, and they needed someone out there to jazz things up. And uh, Elmo Zumwalt was chosen. Now, he was only a rear admiral at this point, but he was designated to go to Vietnam. And on the, on the plane, as a matter of fact, he was uh, fleeted up to vice admiral. First time they had a vice admiral in charge of uh, naval operations in, in Vietnam. And Nitsi and also Secretary of the Navy Chafee, John Chafee at the time, had a lot, of, a lot to do with his posting to Vietnam. Uh, there's a, a famous story, it's in Zumwalt's book and other things written about him, that he was sent out there by Tom Moore. Uh, Tom Moore was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I'm sorry, Chief of Naval Operations, and he did not want uh, Zumwalt around because they had different views about uh, the Navy's social development and similar things, that he sent Viet Zumwalt to Vietnam to get him out of there. Send the son of a bitch to Vietnam, he'll never be heard from again. That's overblown, much overblown. Uh, they had differences, but they had a lot of similarities, and they agreed on a lot uh, during the war and even after the war. So off Zumwalt goes to Vietnam in September of 1968, and when he gets there, he realizes that to make an impact, things have to change. So he went to his boss, uh, Creighton Abrams, who was Comus McVie, and, and Abrams told him, look, the Navy has not performed as well or in great volume as uh, I would have liked uh, before. You've got to change things. So what, what is your thought on changing things? Zumwalt says, all right, we're going to take a new offensive approach to the war, primarily in the Mekong Delta, the breadbasket of Vietnam, home to much of its population. And he, rather than sending riverboats, patrol boats up and down the main branches of the Mekong, he said, we're going to post riverboats along the border with Cambodia. That's to stop infiltration by uh, communists bringing in arms and munitions and reinforcements. Uh, so that was one step he took. This was called the Sea Lords Campaign. Southeast Asia, Lake, Ocean, River, Delta strategy. A mouthful. Uh, but Sea Lords was the name. A second part of that was to send Allied forces, U.S. and South Vietnamese, into the deep Mekong Delta, areas that had been uh, sanctuaries for the enemy, the Viet Cong, up to that point. So those two actions, uh, a lot of forces went at it, and um, he registered great success in this period. Now, this was transitory success. I want to make that point. He gets a lot of credit, justly deserved, for taking this proactive role. Uh, so the forces went out there. Now, at this time, this was after the Tet Offensive, the enemy had really taken a hit. A lot of Viet Cong were killed in Tet. So they're kind of on their back foot in the Delta, the enemy was. Uh, he also had 38,000 American naval personnel in Vietnam, the most at any one time. He also was the benefit of largesse from Washington. Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird was really the father of the so-called Vietnamization program. That is turning the war over to the Vietnamese, let them fight the war, we'll get out. Um, so lots of resources came Zumwalt's way to prepare the Vietnam Navy, the VNN, to take over the war. Um, at, so this worked very well. They, uh, he created a Navy, double the size of the Vietnam Navy, to the point where ultimately he had 1,500 naval vessels. This is riverboats, coastal craft, even a destroyer escort. And also uh, 42,000 South Vietnamese sailors, double the strength of the Navy almost overnight. So it, it looked good, it was following the track of Vietnamization. Uh, but he then 
went off to Washington in the summer of 1970. And thereafter, things went from <laughs> hell in a handbasket, if you will. His successors, uh, Jerome King and uh, Robert Salzer, good guys in many ways, but uh, they didn't have Zumwalt's charisma, his uh, support from, Zumwalt was very much in touch with Washington, uh, with Nitze, of course, with Secretary Laird, who personally liked Zumwalt, was impressed by him, uh, Secretary of the Navy, John Chafee, uh, and Creighton Abrams saying his praises. So he had a lot of support from above. Um, King and Salzer did not have the same thing. Moreover, after Zumwalt left, the resources uh, did not continue in the fashion that had happened before. And a lot of the things that um, he had put in place started to unravel because, frankly, the South Vietnamese society and government and armed forces were not prepared to take over the war totally, uh, just not up to the job, if you will. And Washington started to get cold feet with sending resources out. So things went, uh, did not go well. Uh, fortunately for the Navy, the US and the Vietnam Navy, uh, the war really transitioned away from the Mekong Delta. It moved north where we're looking at conventional North Vietnamese armed forces crossing the DMZ and crossing from Cambodia. Uh, the Mekong Delta became a backwater. Um, so the government maintained control there till the very end in 1975, but it was a very iffy situation. A lot of districts were overrun by the enemy and um, it's often said that uh, the influence of the government only extended the range of the guns on either side of the rivers that they patrolled. So he, he, was a, he did a great job. He was brave, physically brave. Uh, the sailors loved him that served under him. I haven't met anyone who didn't like him and served under him. Uh, he was dynamic. He cared for his men. He would meet uh, planes bringing casualties in, go visit them in the hospital. He, um, he brought the fiance of uh, Lieutenant Bruton, who was, had a terminal illness. He brought his fiance and their family over to Vietnam to be, to be with him um, and gave them accommodation. So he's very caring for his, uh, his people. What the experience in Vietnam did for Elmo Zumwalt was to get him to become the chief of naval operations. Now, he's a vice admiral. He's jumping over the heads of 33 other admirals to become the head of the Navy. Um, his performance in Vietnam certainly earned that, as did his support from his political superiors. So he goes off to Washington and uh, the Washington experience, and I, you know, Zelmo Zomo is, is a legend in the eyes of many. I mentioned William Clinton, mentioning him at his uh, funeral at the Naval Academy. <clears throat> he was very active in the, uh, helping those exposed to Agent Orange in the years after the war, very supportive of the uh, Texas Tech Vietnam Archive and Vietnam veterans and various other activities, chemical weapons uh, activity. Very influential. He, he spoke to presidents after the war, so he had, and he ran for uh, the Senate seat in Virginia after, after the war. However, when he got to Washington, I think this is my view, and others will dispute that, um, it was a mixed bag when he was chief of naval operations. He came in and he said, first of all, we need to rejuvenate the Navy. It's really taken a hit from the war. We're not building enough ships. The ships we have are run down and falling apart. Sailors are exhausted after all these years of war. Uh, we have drug problems in the service. We have race problems. We have gender problems. And we have a society that's anti-establishment and anti-military in many, many facets. So all these ills, and they weren't just uh, related to Vietnam, but they were also in the country. So this was, this was countrywide and service and military wide, not just Navy, but he had to deal with all of that. Well, to handle the resources problem, he began what's called Project 60. And he wanted it done, the plan done in 60 days, which he got. Uh, one of the problems, I would argue, too quick, 
too hasty and a lot of the things uh, not well thought out. But he called for new, new uh, ships, the surface control ship, which was going to be like a mini aircraft carrier that did not sit well with the big carrier folks in the Navy who were predominant at that point. Um, and other things like hydrofoils and innovative, innovative products. He also realized that with the end of the draft, which was in January of 1973, uh, how are we going to get new sailors into the Navy? They're not going to join the Navy to avoid going to the jungles of Vietnam, which had been the case for some before that. Um, we've got to keep them in and make the service a more welcoming place for them. Not only that, we need to look at the demographics. We're not going to have enough young men to join up. So he said we need to keep African Americans to join and to stay in, women to join and stay in. Uh, so he, he went all out in that regard. He is justly remembered as someone who really launched a social revolution in the US Navy. Uh, for too long, blacks, women, and other minorities and, and junior sailors had taken the brunt of a lot of crap. He said, we've got to change how we treat our folks. And he went at that hammer and tong and made great efforts in that regard. Uh, some of the things didn't pan out. He, in fact, he went out with what they called Z-grams, communications to the fleet. And he went directly to those communications to sailors out in the fleet. Um, unfortunately, bypassing the, the senior officers and senior enlisted personnel who took umbrage at that manner of communication. But he went to the sailors to say, here's what we're going to do. 120 Z-grams about getting haircuts or not having to get haircuts or uh, what types of uniforms to wear, times at the PX. You think very mundane things, but things that he knew sailors would uh, would appreciate. So uh, he made a big change, and the Navy definitely did change after that. His successor, Jim Holloway, who's the, the fifth of our admirals, <clears throat> took up a lot of the things that uh, Zumwalt began and further them. Zoom, I mean, Holloway came up with his own Navy affirmative action plan. Uh, so he kept in some of the things Zumwalt started. Other things were thrown into the trash bin. They said these are not well thought out. They're you know, ha not half brain, but they're not, uh, they're not feasible. So uh, there was some change, but he definitely made a difference in that regard. Yeah, I think, of, you know, oh. before we jump to Jim Holloway there, I think of the five admirals, obviously the, the most well-known is Zumwalt. Uh, people will know him for a variety of reasons. And he reminds me, you know, we read his story about, especially going to Vietnam and becoming ComNav 4 in Vietnam. It, it, he reminds me of almost like a Sims style character. You know, he, he's sent out there, he's, he's put in command, but unlike Sims, he comes back and he becomes CNO. And, and now all of a sudden he's given this, this, this overarching command and, and enacts changes. And, you know, I, I don't want to ask you which one of the five is, is the most important because I, I think that's a that's always such a subjective role, but but Zumwalt does seem to get a disproportionate amount of attention versus the other four, and I'm sure in your work you, you'll see how important the other four are compared to Zumwalt. I, I think again he's just a very dynamic person, like you said. He he's like, I've never met like you said I've never met anyone who ever met him who did not like him. Right. You know, you know, especially a sailor who just did not enjoy everything uh, about him, and he came in. But I, I do think also he's hitting a, a huge challenge coming into the Navy post Vietnam, and and I find it very ironic too that the most advanced vessel in the U.S. Navy, except for an aircraft carrier, is named for him. Because I don't, I don't know how much he would like that. To tell you the truth, I don't know how much he would like having that vessel, the the, the new Zumwalt class destroyers, named after him. Because that doesn't seem to be who he was as a person. But uh, well, go ahead. Well, the the Zumwalt class uh, destroyers are right up his alley. He was a surface warfare officer. Right. He was not. He was not an aviator. So I think that's entirely appropriate that uh, the destroyers. <clears throat> but one of the reasons, other than the fact that he was, uh, he had the ears of very powerful, important people in Washington. He always did. He was very politically savvy. But he was also a self promoter. Uh, Zumwalt wrote On Watch and uh, got a lot, he, he pretty much set, he took the literary hit, high hill, if you will, for the study of the Vietnam War, because he came right out after the war, uh, 
with his on watch. And that became the starting point for analysis of the war. He was a self promoter, there's no question about it. When he became CNO, <clears throat> he created a public affairs officer as a rear admiral, first time that had been done. And he had a weekly, here's the CNO story, you know, video thing, very photogenic, bushy eyebrows, and um, wavy hair. He, you know, he was very, uh, very photogenic. So he got a lot of attention. And what he did after the war, I think, also burnished his, his reputation. Let's go ahead and talk about Jim Holloway. Jim, uh, Jim Holloway is obviously the last of the five, and, and he died just recently, back in November, I believe it was, uh, the last of the five to pass away. Uh, one of the most influential, I think, too, on, on top in, in terms of the modern Navy today. So uh, your take on Jim Holloway. Uh, so do you have my image on there? You've got the pictures here. Are uh, you seeing me? Yeah, I, I think we're good. Well, I'm just seeing the pictures of we have. All right. Um, all right, the um, Jim Holloway, I think, probably is the least known of the uh, of the five admirals, but I think that's a mistake. Um, <clears throat> he followed in in the wake of Elmo Zumwalt, and uh, he's not flamboyant like like Zumwalt. Uh, he didn't until recently or the last few years didn't write a lot of books, but I have really uh, changed my opinion about Jim Holloway. And I have to say, uh, truth in, in advertising, I knew him very well because he was a chairman of the board of the Naval Historical Foundation, which shared space at the Naval History and Heritage Command. And I worked with him on numerous projects, um, just a fine individual. But I, he came into the Navy after Zumwalt. He still had to deal with the effects of the Vietnam War on the Navy and uh, what society was going through in the 1970s um, with sailor retention, the lack of money for, for ships, the mood of the country against foreign and military activity. He had to deal with all that. Uh, he also had to deal with uh, Zumwalt's reforms, some of which caused heartburn in the Navy. Uh, the, a lot of the officers, senior officers, were not happy with Zumwalt. President Nixon was especially uh, averse to to uh, Zumwalt. In fact, at one point, several points, he was prepared to fire Zumwalt. If it had not been for Watergate, uh, that would have taken place. Uh, at the very last month of Zumwalt's term in office in 1974, uh, Zumwalt's told not to go on Face the Nation, the television program, to talk about uh, arms control, I think was the issue. Uh, he disobeyed that order. He went on anyway and spoke. And so he was persona non grata at the White House. Uh, also, when in 1972, we had uh, racial and other incidents on board three ships in the Pacific Fleet. Uh, the Kitty Hawk, an aircraft carrier, Constellation, which was in San Diego at the time, and Hacienda, an oiler. Uh, racial fighting and, and, you know, and uh, disciplinary problems. And Nixon really thought that Zumwalt should have come down with a heavy hammer on those sailors who caused trouble. Uh, so they, they did not have a good relationship. Well, Holloway came in, and by the way, Holloway was, you know, if you look at his record, he started out in, in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. He was on board a destroyer as a young lieutenant, uh, saw the action there. He got a medal for that activity. Later in the war, he got other combat decorations. He uh, transitioned from being a surface warfare officer to an aviator. He served in Korea as the head of a squadron of attack aircraft in Korea. Um, he was the he took the America's first nuclear powered aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, to Vietnam. The first time a nuclear powered aircraft carrier saw combat. He was commanding officer for tour two tours off Vietnam. Uh, as that ship was taking part in the Rolling Thunder bombing operation. So he, he knew it from the operational standpoint. He goes back to Washington, he serves in the staff, and he does some very important things with the carrier fires, which are a problem with the carriers at the time. He set in motion actions to prevent those fires from happening again. He also came up with a concept 
call it the CV concept, if you will, where instead of having aircraft carriers with a, a whole bunch of different types of airplanes on it, that you would have those aircraft carriers would have the planes would fit fit the mission. If you're going to bomb North Vietnam, you want to have mostly bombing planes, maybe one squadron of, of fighters for protection. If you're looking for Soviet submarines in the Mediterranean, you want a carrier with lots of anti-submarine planes on board. So he said, rather than building um, other aircraft carriers, let's just call them all aircraft carriers and, and feature fashion the mission to the ship. Uh, so that was very, so he did that. He then goes off to the, head the uh, Seventh Fleet, and he was the guy in charge of the Seventh Fleet for probably the greatest uh, naval campaign of the war. That's the linebacker air and naval campaign against North Vietnam, which along with the mining of Haiphong Harbor um, was instrumental with uh, bringing about the final disengagement from Vietnam in January of 73. So he covered himself in laurels with uh, that operation. He goes off to Washington. Zumwa actually said, come back. I want you to be my vice chief. And he served Zumwalt loyally uh, in that capacity, even though he disagreed with a lot of things the boss was fa in favor of, he, he did his job as the deputy. Um, and then he becomes uh, chairman, I'm sorry, becomes uh, chief of naval operations after Zumwalt, 70 and from 74 to 78, active in that capacity. His major accomplishment was to bring stability back to the Navy. The Zumwalt Revolution was positive in many ways, but it also had problems. And Holloway tried to set things straight. Uh, I think he did an admirable job in that regard. He also reaffirmed the importance of the major aircraft, large aircraft carrier as the main capital ship of the Navy. He didn't have much use for a Zumwalt's uh, surface effect ship or what's called a high-low mix. And uh, so he, he started to set right the uh, personnel problems. He, he endorsed women being at the Naval Academy. He endorsed women being in aviation squadrons and uh, taking, so he was fully supportive of a lot of things that Zumwalt kicked off. Um, he also was forward looking because he didn't like the Carter administration's approach to uh, global issues. How do you deal with the Soviet Union? Well, Carter, policy, the swing strategy was all we need is ships in the Atlantic to ferry troops to Europe. If the balloon goes up, then we'll shift some over the Pacific. Uh, Holloway said, no, 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 that's, that's not it. The Japanese, we have an alliance with Japan and South Korea and they'll, our other allies, they, they don't cotton to that strategy. And we need to be, we don't, can't have a defensive, just protect the ships to Europe strategy. We need to think about offensive operations against the Soviet Union if the balloon goes up. Well, that didn't come to pass in his term in office. He had Sea Plan 2000 and various other strategic plans that didn't make it out of the, off the drawing board. But his successor, the successors in the 1980s, Tom Hayward, a CNO, Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, and of course, Ronald Reagan, took that on board and became the maritime strategy and the 600 ship Navy, which really put the US Navy back in, in form. And that's, a lot of that started with uh, Jim Holloway. And I, I think the, the five people you've looked at right here, uh, going from Fell to Sharp to Moore to Zumwalt to uh, ending there with Admiral Holloway provide an amazing kind of spectrum of the leadership and, and how change is happening in the U.S. Navy from the 60s up into the, to the late 70s, really in the dawn of the 1980s to get us where we are today. Uh, I am, for one, looking forward to the book. It, it cannot be big enough. So if, 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 if I have any say for your editor, I, I'm happy to, to, to go for the big tomb because I, I love books like that. And, and it sounds like you, you have uh, done an amazing amount of research regarding this. I want to take a step back for a little bit and just change topics for a little bit. We have a lot of young historians and, and new up and coming historians who are, who are watching the podcast and, and, and watching the videos. And, you know, you, you came into uh, a field uh, into the Navy Historical Center at the time and, and now Naval History and Heritage Command. Uh, 
what kind of advice would you give to, you know, new historians for fields of research and, and areas to go? You know, I, I've, I've read the, the umpteenth book on the Battle of Leyte Gulf and, you know, has everything <laughs> been written so far in naval history? Or are there still areas that, that really need to be broached into? Well, that's a, that's a good point. So I, I actually came, <laughs> my, for those who know me know that I came from the Army. I was in Vietnam in the U.S. Army. As, we, don't, uh, we don't hold that against you, Ed. <laughs> no, some do. But <laughs> I came in as a, I was the first lieutenant in Vietnam, came back in, in 1970 and early 71 and uh, looked for work. I went to the, to the Army, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps historical centers. Sorry, not hiring. And a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, Oscar Fitzgerald, said, well, come on down to the Navy. And I said, the Navy? I thought they were out in Annapolis. He said, no, no, they're at the Navy Yard. So I went down and the rest is history. I stayed there for 37 years and uh, had to learn my naval history for, pretty quickly. I was into Napoleon, and the German invasion of Russia, things like ground warfare. Uh, so I had to learn my ships and airplanes uh, pretty quickly. Um, but it was a rewarding experience. There, there were times when I thought, gee, maybe I could make more money or uh, pursue another career path. And it just dawned on me. What am I crazy? I mean, I am getting paid to do something that I really loved and enjoyed. And I, I started in the trenches when I began there in December of 71 and uh, did archival work. I did public reference work. I did all kinds of historical support work and then ultimately writing books and managing. But um, I would say persistence is important and consistency in what you do. And, and get jobs done that need to be done fully you know, to the best of your ability and um, don't go for the quick fix do something that's substantial will stand the test of time uh, there's a lot of things that are written that uh, seem great at the time but if the more you look at them uh, they're suspect and also be honest with yourself about uh, what you're doing that um, you should follow things to their final conclusion. Historians are not public affairs types. Okay? We're not trying to make the Navy or the other services look good. We're trying to get to the truth. Now, that was something that always stayed with me. Um, you'll come up and you'll look at material that shows that Naval officers, Naval enlisted, they're people. They make mistakes, they do stupid things, they do you know, bad things in some cases. You can't step back from that. You've got to tell it like it is uh, and take flack. I mean, there were times when uh, folks in the chain of command thought, well, gee, aren't you going a little too far with that? And you have to be able to say, no, I've documented this. This is exactly what my view is and, and go with that. Now, you also, as a historian, you have to be prepared to admit failure, okay? When you've done something, you're, you're happy with it, you think this is great, this is the last word. Other information comes in, so no, no, you, you don't have that correct. You've got to be able to say, you're, I, I was wrong, and go from there. That's how you build on it. We all make mistakes. Uh, and I'll give you a, a classic example, which I think is instructive for uh, young historians. Uh, I worked on the, the Tonkin Gulf incident, which is a well known incident at the beginning of the Vietnam War. And the controversy dealt with, uh, there were two episodes. On the 2nd of August, 1964, the destroyer Maddox uh, did a patrol along North Vietnam, the coast, and was attacked by three uh, PT boats, North Vietnamese PT boats. That happened. There's no question. We got pictures. We have eyewitness accounts. Even the North Vietnamese say, yes, we came out and attacked you on the 2nd of August. The big controversy is two nights later, the 4th of August, when it was alleged that the North Vietnamese again came out and, this, and attacked Maddox plus another destroyer, Turner Joy. I argued, and my colleague Oscar Fitzgerald, we argued in our history of that period that there had been a second attack. Evidence that came to light afterward, witnesses fell away who said there was an attack. Um, lots of information was even problematic at the time, even though we concluded there had been an attack. We were wrong. There was no second attack. Um, now, the smoking gun in that regard was information from the National Security Agency. They had transmissions, top 
highly secretive at the time, which we didn't have access to, that really said, no, no, that uh, second attack did not happen. Um, but how do you tell the president of the United States, oh, we got this wrong? So they didn't really fess up. And, but Johnson knew, Johnson knew that there had not, it was too late. He already had Congress pass the talking Gulf resolution, which off we went to war. So, but anyway, we got that wrong, but everything I've written since that has said, no, we got that wrong. The true fact is that we were attacked on the 2nd of August, we were not attacked on the 4th of August. Well, I think that's such a, a major point, too, because so many historians, too, w will not write something for fear of being wrong. You know, they're, they're gonna, and, and what winds up happening is they sit on it, sit on it, sit on it, and it never gets published and never gets put out. And, mm -hmm. and I think, like you said, as historians, we have to go based on the facts that is before us at the time. And, and this is the evidence, and this is, our, this is what we think. And, you know, we're supposed to be that check. You know, we're not, we're not journalists. We're not doing it on site day or two after. We're taking a long-term view. And, and even, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years after an event, we're still finding out new information. I, I always have an issue when someone tells me, well, it's history. It's nothing new in history. You know, you're teaching ancient <laughs> history. It hasn't changed. We're learning stuff all the time new and, and rewriting history. And, and, and I think that's such a, a great... Uh, aspect to have and to talk about. And, and again, to, to admit that, uh, I personally want to thank you. Uh, I mentioned at the very beginning of our uh, podcast and our broadcast of uh, just the supportive role you gave to me as a very young graduate student historian. And, and one of my one of the prized possessions, I pulled it off the, the bookshelf just a little while ago, is my <laughs> copy of Shield and, and, uh, Shield and Sword, which is the U.S. Navy and the Persian Gulf War. I'm not going to lie, this is some of my favorite work that the Navy Historical Center used to do in, in many ways is put out these, 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 <laughs> these, these histories of events that happened. It's a history on the Persian Gulf War, and it's my very first acknowledgement ever in a book. Uh, but it, it's not just that, the acknowledgement. It, it is the support that you gave. And I, I think there's, there's so many historians in your position who could not give the time of day to a graduate student and just dismiss them, but you didn't. And, and more importantly, uh, uh, we built a relationship over the time. You were very supportive uh, and, and, and not the support. Great job, Sal. It's Sal, you need to do this, you know, the kick in the butt that's needed at times too for grad students. And, and so I always want to thank you for that. I think that's something we want our historians to do for up and coming historians. I think, I think it's very important to get the work out there. And, and it's something you've always uh, encouraged in me. And, and, and that just even that story you just said about the Tonkin Gulf, I think is a very important one where you have it down in writing. You know, I've got the copy of that book and, and it says that. And I remember when, I think it was in Naval History, you came out with that article and, 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 and talked about it, uh, the second Tonkin Gulf attack. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really important. And uh, any closing thoughts, anything you want to add? As, as we well, I just want to say thank you for those kind words. And it's been a good great relationship you and I over the years and I'm glad I was supportive of your work you've done preeminent work in Navy logistics and sea lift I mean you are the go-to guy for sea lift in all of our wars modern wars and uh, so I'm very happy about that and I, you know I've always tried to be supportive of younger historians and hopefully mentored you and others and, and brought along some very good naval historians military historians I'm also very supportive of the uh, North American Society of Oceanic History, a great bunch of folks and doing pioneering work in, in maritime and naval history uh, and military history in general, which I think has really come on board in a big way in this country. It's not just bugles and battles as it used to be. It's much more in-depth, more comprehensive and uh, serious, if you will. And uh, I'm, be, I'm glad to have been part of that and still I'm part of that. Well, and you're definitely still a part of that. And, and so I want to take this uh, moment. I want to thank our guest, Ed Moralda, for joining us for our NASO video podcast. We will have links to all Ed's works. There's a lot of them uh, in the show notes for you to take a look at. Uh, if you liked our podcast, uh, be sure to click like on YouTube or give it five stars in your podcast provider. Please subscribe to our channel. Receive updates as we continue to interview maritime historians. You can follow NASO on Facebook or on Twitter at NASO underscore history. Uh, the best way to follow NASO is to become a member. As such, you receive our newsletter, our quarterly journal, The Northern Mariner, which we publish jointly with the Canadian Nautical Research Society. Go to www.naso.org and click on membership to join. Until our next talk, keep sailing.